you to take your bulletin out and turn to the center and follow along with the outline. Today we continue our series of messages through the, the Sermon on the Mount and we get to another wonderful beatitude that Jesus teaches us. But before we get into that, uh, first of all, I hope each of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving this, this past week. I hope each of you had a, a great time to celebrate with family and friends. My Thanksgiving was awesome. It started with the Cowboys winning on Thursday. I had an awesome meal that day. UK won big yesterday, and I just can't get the smile off my face. It's awesome that we're here together uh, today. For you uh, Louisville fans that are here, I'm sorry. Um, not really, but I, I feel your pain because we've been on the other end of that in the past, but not this year. I uh, hope each of you had a great Thanksgiving with family and friends, and I know that my family celebration was wonderful. Some of you over the Thanksgiving break like to go hunting, and, and you take pictures of trophy bucks that you uh, may be blessed to, to get and all of that. Well, we have this family fun at our uh, Thanksgiving celebrations, and let me show you my trophy picture from the week. <laughs> Kenny and I have this contest to see who will fall asleep and who will get a picture of the other one every Thanksgiving and every Christmas. And needless to say, I won this year. <laughs> so um, I'm very proud of that, and I can count that as one of the other victories right along with UK and Dallas. So uh, I know I'm setting myself up big time for Christmas, but at least it's good while it lasts. The joke is told about two guys who were, were sitting at a bar. And they were, they were the only two guys in the place, and so they struck up a conversation with one another. And one guy said, uh, where are you from? And the other guy said, well, I was actually born and raised right here. And the guy said, seriously? He said, I was too. He said, where'd you go to high school? He said, I graduated from Central High School. He said, well, so did I. And he said, yeah, I grew up in a neighborhood about three blocks from here over on Maple Street. The guy said, no way. He goes, I grew up on Maple Street. What are the odds of that? About that time, the phone rang, and the bartender, he answered the phone, and, and he said, oh, hi, honey. He said, "Nah, not much going on here. It's kind of a slow night. He said, the only two here tonight are the Smith twins, and they're both drunk. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Kent Hughes, Kent Hughes tells, tells a story about two twins, and it's not funny. As a matter of fact, it sets up the topic that I want to, to talk with you about today, but he tells a story of two twins that were the sons of a merchant in a small town. They were twin boys. They were inseparable. They dressed alike. They, they did nearly everything together. They could finish each other's sentences. And when their father died, they took over their, their dad's store and they ran it together. And because they were so much alike in their thinking, their, their business, it ran like clockwork. They, they each knew what the other would, would do and and, but one day, one of the twins got busy as he was ringing up a sale, and he left a dollar bill laying on top of the cash register. And he was doing some other things, and he remembered, I didn't put that dollar back in the cash register. So he went back to put it in there, but it was gone. And so he knew that it was only him and his brother in the store. So he went and asked his brother about it. He said, did you get that dollar off the cash register? And his brother said, no, I didn't get it. He said, are you sure? He said, I, I laid it right there. I know I did, and you and I are the only ones that have been in here, and you sure? Well, his brother could detect that he didn't believe him, and he began to resent it. And they tried to talk about it later on, but the more they talked about it, the conflict just got worse as they realized they didn't trust one another. Well, long story short, every time they, they talked about it, it got worse. They ended up dissolving the partnership. And instead of selling the store, uh, they just built a partition right down the middle of the store and made it into two separate businesses, two separate stores. And th they became competitors of one another. And this went on for 20 years. Well, one day, a, a car with an out-of-state license plate pulled up outside the store. And a well-dressed man stepped out of the car, and he went up to one of the brothers, and he said, Sir, how long have you owned this store? And he said, Well, for the last 20 years. He said, well, then you're the man that I'm looking for. I need to settle a score. He said, 20 years ago, I was not a Christian. I was out of work, and I hopped off a boxcar in your town. I had no money and, and hadn't eaten for three days. And as I walked by your store, I looked in the window, and I saw a dollar bill laying on top of the, of the cash register. And that was a lot of money back then. He said, I slipped in, and I stole that dollar, 
and no one ever saw me. And all these years, especially since I've become a Christian, that has bothered me, and I feel that I need to come back, confess, and make amends. Well, the man was surprised to see the owner of the store, not angry, but instead he put his head in his hands and he began to weep. And then he asked the man if he would follow him next door and tell that same story to the owner of that store, which, of course, was his brother. They both deeply regretted the past 20 years, and his brother also wept as he heard the story, and they embraced each other. A little mercy could have saved those 20 years that they lost over that disagreement. Today we arrive at the next beatitude in our, our journey through the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The basic idea behind the Greek word that's used here to convey this, this idea of mercy, it actually means to give help to the wretched and to relieve the miserable. To give help to the wretched and to relieve the miserable. So there are two components I want to focus on today, two aspects of mercy. One is forgiveness shown to the undeserving. The second, compassion shown to those in misery. You know, first of all, we find that the merciful choose to forgive. I've preached on this in, in recent weeks, so I'm, I'm not going to go into as much depth on, on this aspect as I normally would, but it's interesting how this topic of forgiveness keeps popping up in the various Scripture passages and topics that we've been looking at recently. And sometimes I think uh, I, I will hear messages uh, in different ways, through people, through something I'm listening to on a podcast or on radio or whatever, or in my personal Bible study, and it's like the Holy Spirit is wanting to say something to me. So I think when we hear a, a message repeated frequently, we should give attention to that, that perhaps the Holy Spirit is trying to make a point. You know, the Old Testament scriptures tell the story of Joseph and his brothers, and it serves as a beautiful example of mercy. If you're not familiar with this story, you can find it in Genesis chapter 37. That's where it begins, and then it unfolds over several chapters as the, the scriptures actually go into quite a bit of detail. If you're not familiar with it, let me just kind of give you the highlights. Joseph's brothers perceived that their father thought of him as the favorite. As a matter of fact, you've heard of Joseph and the, this coat of many colors. He had given Joseph this coat, and it was this beautiful, expensive, extravagant coat. And they came to hate that coat. They saw it as the symbol of his favorite status. And so one day, they'd had about enough of this, and they out in the field, and Joseph comes out to them, and he's telling them about this dream where they all bow down to him and stuff, and this just infuriates him. They take him, and they throw him into a pit, and they have a mind to kill him. But one of the brothers says, hey, instead, let's just sell him to these slave traders that were coming through, a caravan of slave traders. So they sold their brother, took him out of the pit, sold him to them, sold him into slavery, and he would be taken off to Egypt. They then told their father that he'd been killed by a wild animal. And so, long story short, as he arrived in, in Egypt, he was eventually falsely accused of rape, thrown into prison, and he thought he was wasting away there. Many years went by. And uh, he saw no sign of, of getting out. But eventually there's a famine in the land. Or there, the Pharaoh has a dream. And the Pharaoh needs someone to interpret this dream. Joseph is able to interpret it. The Pharaoh is so impressed. He takes Joseph from the prison and makes him in what today in our government would be vice president. But second in command over all of Egypt. Well, the dream that he had interpreted said that there are going to be so many good years and then followed by so many lean years. Joseph had wisely stockpiled food so that when a famine hit the land, Egypt was the place to go to receive provision. And as the brothers came from their country to Egypt seeking mercy, seeking this provision, guess who they had to appear before? Their brother, second in command now over all of Egypt. The tables had been turned and he now had the perfect opportunity to enact his revenge but instead of giving them what they deserved, he chose to show them mercy. And because Joseph was strong enough to show mercy, his relationship with his brothers was restored. And I love the ending when they, that he revealed who he really was to them. And at first they were fearful, but then they found nothing but love and mercy in, in him. And it was a great blessing. And many blessings followed that reconciliation as well. 
You know, the story is told of a, a mother who sought a pardon for her son from Napoleon. And the emperor is said uh, to have said, this is his second offense, and this deserves death. And his mother said, I don't ask for, for justice, but Napoleon, I plead for your mercy. But the emperor said, he doesn't deserve mercy. And the mother said, sir, if he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. And so the emperor said, then I will have mercy. And she pardoned his son. You know, nearly every time that I preach on the subject of mercy or forgiveness, I'm reminded of something I heard years ago, and it's always stuck with me, that as Christians, our goal is to be like Christ, right? And we are never more like Jesus than when we forgive somebody who doesn't deserve it. When we do the hard thing, the thing that doesn't come natural, and we extend mercy to a person who doesn't deserve mercy. Kent Hughes tells about a time when he was talking with an associate and the name of a certain person came up in the conversation. And this person had slandered his associate and really just had been ruthless to him. And he admits that he made a derogatory comment about the person that came up in the conversation. And he expected that his associate would agree and they would have a conversation about how he had done him dirty. But to his surprise... His associate defended the person who had slandered him. He said things like, life has been hard for him. We have no idea the pressures that he's been under. He's done a lot of good things, too. And Hughes said he was touched by what he saw in his associate because it was genuine forgiveness. It was the real deal. It was mercy. And guys, when we show mercy, even when vengeance would be understandable, justifiable nobody would blame you but we show mercy instead God approves that's what these beatitudes are all about God approves of the life that this week it shows mercy you know he goes on and says the merciful shall receive mercy blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy the merciful person I think remembers his own sin and just when they are thinking about withholding that mercy, they remember Jesus dying on a cross while they were yet sinners and saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When we display a merciful heart to others, the scriptures say God extends mercy to us as well. And he smiles. He's pleased. But listen, I've also got to point out the opposite side of this truth as well. If we choose to withhold mercy, God says he will withhold mercy from us. Matthew 6, 15. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive you your sins. Guys, if our sins are not forgiven by God, it's not a, a, a theological stretch to, to say that we are jeopardizing our salvation if we sever the, the ties to, and the access to the mercy of God. This holding grudges thing, it's no trivial deal. This is, this is heady stuff. This is a serious matter with serious ramifications. Now, I don't believe that this is talking about people who have chosen to forgive, but they're just struggling with the emotions of it all. Listen, that's natural. That's understandable that nobody feels like forgiving somebody. You can't just flip a switch and say, oh, it's all good now. It's all good. I understand the emotions of it. I have, have had some forgiving I've had to do in my own life. I get it. It takes time for emotional wounds to subside so that you don't feel a knot in your stomach every time you see the person or in their presence of the person that hurts you most deeply. But it does apply to the person who categorically says, I am not forgiving them. I will never forgive them for what they did. And guys, by stubbornly refusing to extend mercy, I believe the scriptures plainly teach that we sever our ability to receive mercy until our heart changes. Jesus taught this strongly in the parable of the unmerciful servant, as it's called often, in Matthew chapter 18. A slave owed his master an immense sum. Uh, it, scholars say it would be over $20 million in today's currency. Well, he didn't have that kind of money. He knew it was going to be impossible for him to repay that debt. So he just went and he threw himself at his master's mercy and begged that he would forgive the huge debt. The, and amazingly, his master did. 
He, he wiped the debt away. But then the slave went out and he found a fellow slave who owed him another uh, amount, but much less, about three months' salary, it was, it was said by scholars. And he demanded that he pay up and be and thrown into prison. When his master learned that his slave had done this, he summoned the slave. And here are his words in Matthew 18, verse 32 through 35. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not, if you, had, had, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Now, you don't have to work for CSI or anything to figure out who's who in this parable. God has forgiven our sin debt. We deserved hell. That was our fate until Jesus went to the cross and took our place so that our debt could be removed we could be forgiven. But then we come across in, in situations in life where we say, but that's not worth being forgiven. I will never forgive. I will withhold mercy from them. And I think the one who gave his all to purchase our mercy, our forgiveness, has every right to say, well, then I'm, I, maybe I won't forgive you for your sin, debt. Guys, that's tough teaching, I know. But listen, it's critical that we get it. It's critical that we understand it and live by it. Jesus is talking to the religious. He's talking to churchgoers here, people who otherwise live a, a godly moral life, who, that we must forgive those who wrong us no matter what. No matter what. As the one who died to make grace available to us, he sets the standards of who gets forgiven. And he takes them very seriously. You know, of lesser importance than that, certainly, but still important, is to think about how other people will tend to extend grace, the same grace toward you that you extend to others. If you are a person who's generally kind and, and forgiving, most people, when you mess up, will be kind and forgiving to you in return. They'll give you the benefit of the doubt. But if you are a person who has a reputation for holding grudges, for being judgmental and quick to, to criticize others and point out their flaws, and you have very little tolerance or patience with people who don't do what you think they should do, then don't be surprised when that same measure is used to you. James 2.13 says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Guys, when it comes to mercy, that saying is often true, that what goes around comes around. You may be the one extending forgiveness today and think that you are doing some wonderful thing, which you indeed are with God's help. But there will likely be a day when you will be on the other end of this equation. And desperately, more than anything, you are hoping and praying that someone will forgive you, that you can be forgiven by someone else. What measure have you used to others? Matthew 7, 2 says, For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard that you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Guys, mercy often invo involves a choice to withhold retribution. Some mistake that as, as weakness. And they say, Greg, you don't understand my situation. I can't forgive this. I, I'm not weak like that. I'm not just going to let them walk away from this and not pay for this. They have to pay. Listen. The courts, they have their justice, and I'm not talking about that. I believe in justice under the law. I'm talking about our personal relationships and interactions with people. It takes a strong person to have the power to enact revenge, but to choose to withhold it. To choose to withhold it. Isn't that what Jesus did on the cross? Jesus, the one that spoke the universe into existence, submitted himself to a cross while everyone around him was doubting him, was uh, ridiculing him and mocking him. He had the power to just take his pinky and strike every one of them dead right there. But the greatest power in this universe withheld it. And instead he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know. Guys, he is our model in all things, but especially in mercy. It doesn't make you a victim when you forgive. 
but rather think of yourself as the victim when you allow another person to pull you down from God's standard, to pull you down to their level. It takes a strong person to extend mercy. Next of all, the merciful, they show compassion. Compassion has been defined as sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings and the misfortunes of others. Compassion is the ability to see a situation through someone else's eyes. It's the ability to see from another's perspective and to consider how they must feel. Mercy is not simply a feeling. We all feel sorry for somebody from time to time. But mercy takes it a step further and it moves us to do something to alleviate the burden of another when we have the opportunity. Jesus made this point when he told the parable of the Good Samaritan. And if you're not familiar with that one, three men passed by a guy who had been mugged and left for dead on the side of the road. Two of them were religious types, right? You would expect they would stop and have mercy, but Jesus said, nope, they went on. I don't know what, what they had going on, but it was more important than helping someone in need, they thought. But the third one, the most unlikely, the Samaritan who they had racial differences between their, their ethnic uh, groups and so forth. But he's the one that saw him in need and he helped. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He answered his own question. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, you go, and you do likewise. You do likewise. Now, Jesus told this story, I think, likely to prove that the religious establishment of his day was missing the point on one of the two of the greatest commandments. Remember when the guy asked Jesus, said, what is, what is it all about? Jesus said, love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And I think Jesus pointed out and said, you're missing it on that one. You're missing the point when you don't show mercy to your neighbor. I read about a 19th century preacher who had a friend whose horse had been accidentally killed. And a crowd of onlookers came and they gathered and they offered words of sympathy. And the preacher stepped forward and he said, I'm sorry, five pounds, which was their current of, uh, uh, currency. And he said, how sorry are you? And he put his five pounds in and then he passed the hat because he saw that true mercy demands more than words. It demands action. Now, I can't prove the authenticity of this story, but I've heard for, for many years the story that was told of uh, one night in 1935, Fiorello LaGuardia, who was the mayor of New York, who you might recognize LaGuardia Airport that's named after him, he showed up at a, a night court in the poorest part of the city. And he dismissed the judge one evening and said, you take the night off, I'll, I'll rule for the bench, yeah. And in one case involved an elderly woman who was caught stealing bread to feed her grandchildren. And LaGuardia is said to have said, told the court, I've got to punish you, so either $10 or 10 days in jail. And as he spoke, he reached in his own wallet and he took out the $10 and he paid the woman's fine. And he then fined everyone in the courtroom 50 cents for living in a city where a person has to steal bread so their, their grandchildren can eat. The hat was passed around and the woman left the courtroom not only by having her fine paid by the judge but also she left with a collection of $47.50. That's a picture of mercy. Compassion in action. Guys, I know it's easy to be cynical these days. I know this because I'm convinced that this mercy thing comes easy for some people. It's natural. Some people are naturally empathetic, compassionate, and they naturally do these things. And then there are people that are kind of like me, which I'll just tell you the truth. I tend to look at things through a rational viewpoint that doesn't always have the mercy I should have. Sometimes I, I'm guilty. I'll look at things and go, well, they brought that on themselves. Didn't they see that coming? It's hard to feel sorry for them. They should have seen that coming a mile away. At our house, anytime there's something going on, I'm the one that's good about showing the tough love, you know? I told the boys not to do it. They did it. Now let them deal with it, you know? Whatever. Well, my wife, she's the empathetic one. She's the one, oh, you know, how can you do that? That's so mean. That's not the way we roll as parents, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we balance each other out. There's a time for tough love. There's also a lot of times for compassion. And, you know, I'm speaking, I guess, to the ones that are like me and 
sometimes it's easy for us to become cynical. And sometimes we, we don't have the mercy that we should have. There are a lot of people in our culture today who simply won't work to provide for themselves. There are people who take advantage of the kindness of other people. But there are also plenty of people out there who, due to no fault of their own, are struggling. There are some folks that, due to physical uh, situations or, or maybe emotional situations, or mental health, whatever it might be, they can't hold a job and maintain a steady income. Some folks, due to, to uh, their upbringing, they just don't know any other way of life than what they've always lived. Others have had tough breaks. Their life wasn't always like this, but something happened, and they have never been able to get over it and recover from it. Some have even created their own problems. Yeah. They took the first steps that led to the addiction. They did the things that got the, their, their reputation ruined, that got them uh, a record or whatever it might be. They did these things. And it's easy to say cynically, you made your bed, now lay in it. But that's not what mercy says. Guys, we've got to guard our hearts against becoming cynical and uncompassionate. If there's not a consistent evidence of mercy and compassion in our life, then the Bible says that's a red flag. That's a red flag that this is, has preached to me this week. 1 John chapter 3 says this, If anyone has the world's goods and he sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? If you don't have that mercy. Guys, maybe you've got some room for improvement in this area. In these Beatitudes, uh, Jesus, he gives us a, a spiritual health check and kind of an authenticity check in different areas of our lives. What about you? Are you merciful? Is there anyone in your life right now that there's an unresolved conflict, that there's something you're holding on to and there's mercy that you need to give? And, forgiveness you need to extend secondly are you merciful toward those who are in need are there people right now that are on your radar that you have the ability to help but you just for whatever reason have not now i'm not saying that we go out and we just write checks to everybody that that thinks it's a good idea that needs some money we've got to use discernment we've got to but if we if we err let's err on the side of mercy and we, if all other things are equal Maybe you'll get taken advantage of now and then. But maybe somebody will see the mercy of God. You know, if you're honest enough to admit that you have some room to grow, I just want to leave you with three suggestions of next steps you can take today. First of all, confess your need to God for greater mercy. Pray to God and admit, God, there's somebody I need to forgive. I've been asking you for your forgiveness, but I've been holding on to some stuff. I need you to help me let go. God, I don't feel like doing it. I don't. There's nothing in me that wants to do it. But for your sake, and really for my sake as well, I choose, I choose that I'm going to forgive them. And I ask you to help me do it. At, pray and ask God to, to help you feel the forgiveness in your heart, however long it takes. Or maybe you need to pray and admit to God, God, I don't have compassion in my life for people that I should. Admit that you tend to be inwardly focused and you, you have a tendency to be hard-hearted and tell him, God, I just want to be like Jesus and I know that Jesus was merciful and I want to be like him. Will you help me? Second of all, I encourage you to read and meditate upon the scriptures that pertain to mercy. And that sounds cliche, but there is no substitute for letting the Word of God speak into your life. Because it's alive, guys. It can transform you if you will meditate upon it. As I do each week, I've listed some scriptures in the bulletin that relate to today's topic, and I encourage you to read them. I encourage you to meditate upon them. And ask the Holy Spirit to speak into your heart and help conform your life to what those scriptures describe. Help them to become a reality in your life. If you're in a life group, after reading and discussing these scriptures together, I encourage you to pray for one another and spend some focused time just praying for us all to have the mercy that God wants us to have. And then thirdly, practice. Practice mercy. Simply go out and be intentional about being merciful. When you start to become cynical and you start to think of all the reasons you shouldn't be merciful, catch yourself and think, you know what? I'm going to imitate Christ. 
Think about the cross. Think about what Christ has done. Forgive those who've wronged you. Pray for them. Treat them better than they deserve to be treated. Do it anyway. You may have to fake it until you make it at first, but do it anyway. Be intentional. Come alongside those who are hurting. As God gives you the opportunity, if you have the means to help somebody, do it. Be merciful. Let's pray.